Thank you very much for having me here. I'm very pleased to talk about fuel, which is the subject of a book that I have coming out. So you, you're welcome if you want to begin this lecture closing your eyes. I'm going to ask you to imagine something. So it's September 19th, 1783. You're inside the Palace of Versailles. If you like, you might see yourself in period costume reflected in the mise en a beam of the Hall of Mirrors accompanied by the court, including Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette. You go outside just at the moment when the Montgolfiers have finished all the processes associated with heating air. Imagine they have cleared the launch pad of any residual smoke odors and are just lifting off, accompanied by several farm animals. Oblivious to the preparatory energy intensive stages, you marvel as the balloon floats upward and then comes back down safely. And be assured no animals were harmed in this experiment. OK, you can open your eyes. So this is a dream. Early on, the Montgolfier brothers believed they had captured actually a new element called Montgolfier gas inside a paper bag filled with hot air. Later, their compatriots replaced air, which cools very quickly, forcing the balloon to descend, with hydrogen gas. Hydrogen as fuel is another dream, which you in Iceland know very well. In fact, the day I visited this filling station, Next door, in the non-dream part of the filling station, a gas-guzzling American car happened to be filling up. <laughs> so you probably also know that hydrogen does not exist ready to be utilized as such, but must be subject to an energetic catalytic process if it is to be used as fuel. The dream of generating energy from nothing from air or from waste, human or animal, or from some material with no consequences is a very long-standing one. For those of us who have been absent before the start of motion, the air, the balloon lifting off seems to be powered by nothing. And I haven't said anything about the fuels used to produce the bag or a ballon in the Montgolfier's paper factory. So this is the dream that I try to expose in my recent work as I also try to pull it apart and subject it to different ways of thinking in order to scramble our collective brain about fuel as a series of matters that for me are distinct from energy. But in case you think I'm talking about past history or about a dream that precedes the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, recently French engineer Guy Negre has developed cars for city driving that run on air. Of course, like Victorian clocks or uh, air brakes or air guns, the air must first be compressed. And how do we compress it? By human force, by steam, or wood, or by electricity, and so on. Air can, in the here and now, perform as a fuel, but only after secondary intervention, after the insertion of some other fuel into a machinic system that stays behind while the car is mobile. Yes, the air car is futuristic in design, but perhaps also with a touch of nostalgia for those micro or bubble cars of the futuristic past. So for me, the air car represents the idea of a future as continuation of the past in as much as it supposes absolute personal mobility. It is worth noting then 
that most policymakers and engineers do not talk seriously right now about wind or solar powered vehicles since these fuels are intermittent and fair to con fail to conform to the heterogeneous motion demanded by drivers. And incidentally, the car itself, while it's a very potent symbol, in fact, accounts for all of, in fact, all of global transportation, including cars, but other forms of transportation, contribute only about 14% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Although in the US, that number is, that percentage is much higher. So in climate change, the focus on the car has often been, I think, a distraction from other emissions sectors as well as from land use change, for example, or other uh, factors. Of course, it's much, much easier to talk about the prime consumer object than it is to talk about massive planetary disruption. So in the image, the fantasy or the dream of the free floating balloon, we have moved far away from the dirty, difficult labor of the extractive industries so influential as to have shaped collective actions the world over. You know, many people say the idea of the general strike came out of the coal mine, right? We are far in time and space from the labor of the automobile industries, so influential as to have given a name, Fordism, to an entire paradigm, not just of the physical exertion involved in the assembling of cars, but of wages and unions, surveillance and living conditions, ideology, and in fact, labor itself. To call upon air as a fuel is to move outside of the sphere of the human in the carbon present to a realm of utopian fantasies of green fuels and green jobs, whatever else these terms might mean, they are certainly performed by a multicultural and yet patriotic labor force that finds its sense of collectivity, not in a struggle against capital, but in its dedication to nature. And yet this very sphere of dreams is structured around a fossil fuel, one that is currently responsible for bolstering the US economy uh, and to some degree the world's economy. So here are some photographs that I took uh, close to my house in upstate New York um, that are essentially lobbying for um, drilling for natural gas. And then moving to another continent, um, this is a, um, a commercial. And I think it's just interesting that, um, just to show it to you quickly, because it happens to have balloons in it. a great deal of talk about future fuels. So when is this future? It hasn't already come fast enough. We're always on a threshold, always about to arrive at a tipping point, and yet in some sense we are always too late. So for me, the very fact that future fuels are perpetually deferred actually strengthens the links between hydrocarbons and the present economy. In the present carbon economy, we live under a prevailing view that environmental ethics in the broadest sense, or green conscience, and power are antithetical terms. 
marketers who try to reconcile them actually only end up strengthening the distinction. Consider, for example, a recent Volkswagen advertisement for clean diesel powered vehicles. We see a car speeding along a highway flanked by green uh, lawns and wind turbines. Uh, on the top of the ad, it asks, will you forfeit power in exchange for doing good? The answer, of course, is no. But no here, meant to distinguish Volkswagen from its competitors, suggests that power and ethics are indeed in the normativity of everyday consumption incompatible. And then here is a landscape that I think perfectly depicts one of my central points, driving, mobility, living just as before, but with Klaus Lackner's carbon uptake leaves interspersed among the turbines. No need to think about what we would do with the carbon that we sequester. Somewhere in the near future, can, somebody in the near future can worry about that. Fuels, as I try to distinguish them from systems of energy, are pure flowing potentialities, not yet inserted into a system that will consume them and then use them up. So just a little bit distinguishing fuel from energy. Uh, you probably know that energia comes from the Greek, um, really meaning to enact or to put into action. The 1842 Encyclopedia Britannica defined energy with one sentence, a term of Greek origin signifying the power, virtue, or efficacy of a thing. In the first half of the 18th century, philosophers began a broader discussion of how to understand, measure, and characterize terms like activity, work, and force. By the early 19th, scientists began to group together phenomena such as falling water, expanding air, heat, and electricity. By 1899, the entry on energy in the Britannica is six pages long. So that's from 1842 to 1899. This begs the question, is it even legitimate to speak of energy prior to 1800? In any case, it would seem that fuel is much older than energy. So what is fuel? The English word derives from Old English, from Old French, um, the word foil used in the early 14th century to refer to a bundle of firewood. And before that, uh, the origin is the Latin legal term focalia, meaning the right to demand material for making fire, itself derived from the neuter plural of the Latin focalis, pertaining to the hearth, from focus or hearth. And a similar origin exists for the Scandinavian variants, as I understand. But recall that Greek and Latin and the Romance languages had other words for the matter of fire, primarily pyros and ignis. In the constellation of the Greek hestia and the Latin vesta, we find focalia, focus, the hearth, fuel. Hestia is an ambiguous goddess, rarely depicted, and then perhaps as a simple veiled woman holding a staff. In ancient epic, the hearth is related to a space of protection, the oikos, which is also, also the origin of both economy and much later ecology, the home, family, or center. But sometime around the 1300s, fuel begins to expand from the hearth as a place uh, to the materials themselves, the small bundles of firewood that are combusted. Fuel begins then in a pre-industrial world where homes are heated by wood, gathered in forests, with a variety of different issues around sovereignty and property. Later, fossil fuels, and technologies for extraction reciprocally produce the modern era, the Anthropocene. 
Certainly, we are compelled to acknowledge the power of fossil fuels in a hierarchy. But in my work, I'm not an engineer that has to deliver a system functioning at high capacity. I have the freedom to speculate about all different forms of fuels, to de-hierarchize or reorganize them in whatever way suits me. I feel compelled to problematize the popular and optimistic idea that in the very near future, once technology supported by enterprise, government, and universities will have caught up and economies of scale adjusted, we will simply be able to insert alternative or renewable fuels into existing infrastructures, existing modes of production, and there will be no consequences. So, I'm going to now talk about another hypothetical fuel, a fantasy fuel, if you like, one not part of any future fuels portfolio currently under consideration, helium-3. Helium-3 is a chemical element thought to exist in some abundance on the moon. In fact, in Duncan Jones's science fiction film of that title, Helium-3, mined by a company called Lunar Industries, has solved the world's pollution problem. The term climate change is not used, along with poverty and hunger. We know this because the film opens with a commercial that informs viewers of the film. Presumably, Earth dwellers must be quite familiar with the marvelous effects of the salvation fuel about life now. We are shown older images of smokestacks and deserts replaced now with smiling ethnic types holding apparently healthy babies in verdant fields. Our clean planet brought to you by Lunar Industries. The infomercial at the beginning of Moon raises many questions for the critical viewer. Does Lunar Enterprises have a monopoly? We only see their apparatuses functioning on the moon. If so, why advertise? Is it a global corporation, or perhaps American, but one that has chosen to spread its technology to the entire globe out of charity, or perhaps because it's so easy to do so? And what about the energy infrastructure that takes up the helium-3 and distributes it to the people? How do they function? Have they changed the modes of production of goods and services here on Earth? Have they, how have they led to peace? Or is the fuel simply inserted into what was already there? But probably the viewer has no time to formulate such questions adequately because the commercial ends abruptly and the film begins. Now I have a spoiler alert, so if you haven't seen the film, it's wonderful, and you don't want to hear some more about it, close your ears, and I will let you know when you can listen again. So we will soon learn, long before he does, that the sole miner on the colony, Sam, is a clone. He receives occasional transmissions. They're tape delayed, supposedly because of a satellite misfunction, from a perky blonde wife and a baby that he believes to be his. So we must ask, is it possible that we are able to harvest helium-3 from the moon, send it to Earth in cryogenic pods to solve a wealth of problems, energetic and social, to develop clones who do not know they are clones, a fully functional computer that controls the environment and the harvesters, all of this and yet we have not perfected something close to real-time communication from moon to earth? <laughs> In his grim sets, reminiscent of the 70s sci-fi he watched as a child, Jones has created a mining colony as dark and dismal as any coal mine of the past. Because lunar mining is automated, he can emit the large labor force and the sense of miserable collectivity that still conditions minoring, mining to this day. Yes, Sam is duped by the corporate entity that hires him. There is no security on the moon, 
although one would think that if the company can build an entire colony and transport fuel in three days, there would be a threat of breach by bad entities. The harvesters are named for the, for the four evangelists. No Islamic group is in sight. No rogue states have come there. The nuclear family is intact, and technology on Earth does not seem to have advanced in any significant way so as to disrupt social life. Indeed, as we hear very briefly in the radio transmission played over the final seconds of the film footage, the American government, appalled by the shady ethics of lunar industries, was there no regulation of this new fuel and its extraction? has condemned the use of innocent clones, so Sam is a hero for democracy. Moon suggests a fantasy that if, when a fuel comes so clean and so powerful that it will profoundly change the earth, its extraction displaced in time and space, still it will not disturb us with profound questions about what it means to be human what it means to live, love, and labor. We can go on just as before, just as Verne's colonists, when rescued in the mysterious island, recreate their very mysterious island in the American Midwest. Now, though, consider another piece of writing from today. Not a novel, but a treaty still one imbued with a certain sense of futurity and deferral, a treaty produced in Ecuador to not take oil from the ground. To be fair, this treaty reflects several different, possibly competing strategies or goals. One is simply a global effort to preserve extreme biodiversity in the Yasuni National Park, which sits atop of a large oil reserve. So there's a surface versus subsurface debate at stake, such as we find in various parts of the globe around issues of resources. And the very idea that these are two separate realms, and yet distinct, so distinct that we can regulate them with different kinds of laws, is another kind of fantasy for me, or a dream of mastery. Another aspect of this treaty is to use funds collected from crowdsourcing and lobbying of nations and NGOs to help alleviate poverty of indigenous people in the region. And a third is that some of the donations have been promised toward the development of alternative or future fuels, thus helping reduce Ecuador's dependency on oil. But most significantly, the Ecuadorian government is asking for funds to not use the oil in part as a way of keeping 400 million tons of carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere. How should we think about this in terms of narrative, or to use a word that is important in contemporary philosophy, potentiality? Very recently, new studies have come out in the general and science press that are of great importance for thinking about fuel use, or what I call potentiality. I won't say too much today about this term, except to note that it contains an idea of power and yet simultaneously describes a moment before power has been put into action. In that sense, potentiality is a word with great implications for thinking with fuel. The most significant text, of course, is the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change, AR5, a document filled with various specific recommendations or predictions about fuel and energy non-use. <clears throat> in a smaller study published in Nature, a British scientist, Christoph McGlade, and colleagues have quantified, in both monetary and purely physical terms, how much oil, gas, and coal already discovered would have to remain in the ground in order to avoid catastrophic warming. The study is based on the assumption that cheaper reserves would be tapped first, and then tough oil or uh, other forms would, would come later. The authors are able to paint a very real scenario about losses for large energy companies and nation states 
they name names. Now clearly this study, which imagines not using over 90% of US and Australian coal, as well as almost all of Canada's oil sands, represents, in some sense, a concretization of potentiality. Yet perhaps potentiality, in the thorny philosophical sense developed by modern thinkers from Aristotle, also exceeds it. So at first glance, the layperson might not make much of this. But I am convinced that critical theory is essential for placing this non-use phenomenon of fuels into a crucial perspective. To leave fuel in the ground means to acknowledge that it exists, to have measured and studied it, to have invested money in research and development, leases, and so on. Leaving fuel in the ground also then means a special relationship to it that is not just non-consumerist. The dictionary of fuels that I have written, fuels real and imagined, possible and impossible, opens up a way to begin to address the unfathomable complexity of the Anthropocene. In the simplest terms, following the thought of philosopher Giorgio Agamben, potentiality holds a kernel of hope, not a hope that we will finally solve carbon with an alternative to fossil fuels. Certainly, markets are already opening in this direction, but not fast enough, not enough, not far enough. And then what? Not a hope that we will discover a form of carbon capture and storage that, for whatever political or technological reasons, will garner enough support to mitigate greenhouse gases or stabilize emissions at the target of, well, 350 ppm when I began working on fuels, now 450 and counting. Not a hope for a green revolution, an occupation of energy producers. Not a shift of individual behavior in conservation of energy. Again, conservation might have, is already having, an impact on overall global greenhouse gas emissions as part of a larger strategy of diverse approaches. But ultimately, we need something else and more. And it might be enough then to insist on the separation of fuel from energy just to get people to think, to draw our attention away from the energy machines and systems already in place simply because the future may look radically different. Thinking about fuels as matters or even as actants a term used in recent philosophical work oriented around objects, might shift balances between mitigation and adaptation or resilience with regard to climate change. Paradoxically, though, my distinction between fuel and energy, while essential, can never really hold. Fuel wants to do without energy, in as much as it is potentiality. But in asserting its power, energy wants to do without fuel, which taunts it. Instead of trying to resolve this contradiction or take a side in it, I would like to leave it as a tension that is productive for our thought, not because it provides solutions, but precisely because of its inexorable power in the human, non-human, and post-human web. Thank you very much.